but how to accelerate the creation of activated movements and communities. And I want to publish that material for the world so that you can lead your movement better. I hope in the next 45 minutes we redefine what leadership is. To me, leadership is not about the hero, and it certainly isn't about the individual. It's about the host who has the potential to convene a community that could build a movement. And I know that everybody here and everybody watching has that passion and that desire to do just that, to lead movements of change. Whether that's a humble movement of change in your own organization or whether that's a movement of change in the world that's fundamentally going to have ripple effects on how people love themselves and open up and create social change, everyone in here is a movement leader. Now, I really put myself and this conversation that we're going to have, and by the way, I'd like it to be a conversation, even if we're not going to actually actively dialogue. Could you put the lights out, please? I want to see you. I want to feel this conversation in your eyes and in your reactions, if you don't mind. I want to make sure that the hurdle of this dialogue is pretty simple. If you're not doing something different in two to three months from now because of this dialogue, I will have failed you. It's not just about entertaining you. To me, this conversation needs to move to action because action is what's needed in the world today. We need to make transformation occur. A couple of people have said to me while I've been here at AFEST, you know, this. I really loved a lot of the things you had to say, but I have no idea what you do. <laughs> well, aside from commercially, I coach executive teams, but that's not what I think I do. My core is that I run a research institute for changing human behavior in the workplace. How many people out of curiosity in the room have someone's behavior in the workplace you'd like to change? Raise your hands. Okay, great. Are you sitting next to them? No. <laughs> Are you married to them? Do you think that they would say the same thing about you? Good. A pretty self-aware group. Look, the work that we do around human behavior and research is all focused on accelerating what we call collaborative action. We can't get stuff done without the interdependencies. But in this audience, one of the things I want to very much focus on is not just the workplace, but you as a human. This is my younger son on pretty much the month within which we got him. Uh, he was 12 years of age. It was a very long and protracted pregnancy. Just kidding. Um, <laughs> he came to us from the foster care system. And what is that? What is that little face on the left saying? Yeah, it, it, by the way, I won't say what it actually said. It would shoot the profanity as too much for even this room. But what that young man would consistently say is, you will never be my effing father. Now, I don't know how many of you have seen that face on one of your customers? <laughs> or coworkers? Because that face actually exists in the hearts of a lot of people. It's the lack of psychological safety that says, you won't hurt me. Now, that might come out as passive-aggressive behavior. It might come out as conflict avoidance. It might come out as fear sequestering your true voice. But so many of us have that face of self-protection on top of us. The work that we're going to be talking about for the next 40 minutes is the work that can be applied to every part of your life. It's not just about how we can bring the most out of a group of people for productive action in the workplace, but it's how we relate to people in the world and how that relationship breeds productivity, whether it's in a family, a spousal relationship, whether it happens to be in the workplace or in a social construct where you're trying to make a difference among a community of individuals. So I wanted to make sure that our time together is not just focused in one particular area, it should be focused on where you want to activate new relationships in your life. Now, the world around us has gotten crazy. It is a very different world. 
And this world around us, as crazy as it is, I'll, I'll, I'll give you a few of the earmarks. The first thing that is absolutely true, and we all know this, is that the transformation pressure to meet competition and meet marketplace demands has never been greater. For an organization, for instance, like here at Valley, it blows my mind what Vision has been able to do in an incredibly cluttered world, an incredibly cluttered space, to be able to attract the people like yourselves and be able to create a business in a space like this with such velocity. And by the way, I think that's worth just a, a round of applause for the business acumen that has made this all possible. <laughs> Many of us struggle with that transformational pressure. But one of the things that I can truly tell you is that the most true thing that's going on in the world today is that because of that extraordinary pressure to perform and to transform, there's not a single one of us that can do the job. Soak that in. It's okay to be overwhelmed. It's okay to fundamentally understand that I cannot and I have been, there have been times in my life where I've literally sat on my bed on a Saturday with business cards all over the place, thinking about my business, with tears in my eyes, overwhelmed as a leader of a company, struggling. And I know that feeling, and I don't know if anybody else has ever experienced a feeling like that, with that kind of overwhelm. But the key is to pass beyond that overwhelm and step into a space where you don't have to struggle by yourself, where your leadership is defined by your capacity to enable and create a collective people that won't let our mission fail. And that's true leadership today. True leadership today calls for radical interdependency. It calls for the transformation of possibility through inclusion, not through individual brilliance. It calls for individuals that can tap in to the power of everybody around them, even the meekest of individuals who has that reptilian brain firing off an overdrive where they can't find their voice, but you as a leader can create a space and hold a space that brings people into their greatness. This is what leadership is about, and I fail miserably every day. I literally fail miserably every day. I wish I could find this leader that I'm talking about to come and be the managing partner of my company, because it is not me. But I know that that's my aspiration. And by the way, if there's anybody out there that would like to be the managing partner of my company, I would ha happily embrace you, because this is a very tough job. But I really mean that. There are so many, so many of you that I've met since I've been here are so much better at this form of leadership than I am. My scarcity, my former, I'm learning from Mind Valley, my former scarcity mindset, firing off scarcity and overdrive from that poor kid, you know, growing up in Pittsburgh, unemployed, etc. That individual all too often creeps into my leadership but I know what my North Star is. Now, what I can tell you is that if our job is to create a leadership community, creating a movement where authority and hierarchy doesn't define success, the critical element is relational. I wrote a book about relationships a number of years ago called Never Eat Alone. And today, we have recognized that your capacity to lead is your capacity to manage networks. Whether that's in a Fortune 100 company with hundreds of thousands of individuals, you can't get anything done unless you can effectively navigate and manage the networks to join your movement of transformation for the company. Or whether you're a single individual without any associates or employees, but you have a vision and a movement where you're collectively pulling artists together to reinvent and recreate the world around sustainability. All of it requires you to marshal powerful networks in service of a shared mission. It really doesn't matter what your organization design or structure is. But the element of leadership is relational. 
Now, a buddy of mine is, I've known him for a number of years. I just call him Mehmet. Many of us know him as Dr. Oz. He will tell me, and I've been working with him to recognize that even our health is grounded in our relational competency. Certainly our leadership and our ability to grow our careers, our ability to sell or influence, all of these elements are relational, foundational. Does that make sense to you? You know, I learned this kind of early on. So I said I, I grew up in Pittsburgh. My old man was an immigrant steel worker. Sono Italiano, mio padre è da Milano. And back in the 70s, the steel industry was crumbling down around all of us. My dad was unemployed for months and months at a time. And my pop, uh, one long stint, my mother had to get a job. She had to become a cleaning lady. I had to go get a job at about 11 years old. And I went to the local country club where I could make 20 bucks a day carrying golf clubs. By the way, my mom was making 20 bucks a day as a, as a cleaning lady. So this was meaningful money for us. It wasn't just spending money for a kid. And my pop said something to me. He said, Keith, show up at the golf course half an hour early. I'm like, pop, there's nobody there. I don't understand. He goes, Keith, show up at the golf course. So as soon as he started repeating himself, I knew I had no shot. So I, <laughs> I called it immigrant Tourette's. He would just blurt shit out. I didn't know what it meant. I just had to do it, right? All right, Pop, I'll show up at the golf course half an hour later. So I'm showing up at the golf course, and I'm walking around, trying to figure out you know, what to do, board. And I was noticing a few things. I was noticing how the pins were placed, which actually was valuable to me, because on some blind dog legs, when my golfer didn't know if it was a nine or an eight to approach the green, I could say it, because I'd say, oh, no, the, the, tea, the, greens in, I mean, the pins in front of the green. I know how the greens were cut every morning, um, and I could read greens better, oddly enough. It wasn't on purpose. This was my, why my dad sent me out there. He just wanted me to have ambition, drive, and get up and go, etc. So, But I recognized all of these things. There was a woman by the name of Mrs. Poland. Mrs. Poland was the best, best golfer in the country club. And she was extraordinary. She had me as her caddy one time. And when she had me as her caddy, um, we had a great round. And then afterwards, she's going, are you available tomorrow? I'm like, yeah. Sometimes I would wait up there for a week, and I'd get out twice. The third day she asked me to caddy for her. The fourth day she asked me to caddy for her. And I'm just like, oh my God, this is fantastic. On the fifth day, she started to ask me questions that made me uncomfortable, very personal questions. By the way, this isn't a story about Mrs. Robinson or anything. We're not <laughs> going there. She asked me things like, what do you want to do with your life? And I'm like, oh wow. Please, lady, I just want to be a good caddy. I don't want to take the 20 bucks home to my parents. You know, I was like my son who wanted to push people away, even though they could be helpful to me. And she asked me again, Keith, damn it, tell me what you want to do. I said, well, I want to go to college, which wasn't predetermined in my, where I grew up. She goes, and? I said, well, I know you're going to, and you're going to laugh. But my dad says, if I work real hard, I get good grades. Maybe, uh, maybe I could be president of the United States someday. She said, yeah. She said, you know, I bet you could, and I would vote for you. By the way, anybody could now, right? Ah. <laughs> I was kidding. Um, who'd have known? Um, and... Two weeks later, she had the local congressman in her foursome, Congressman Murtha, who gave me some advice as we were going around the 18 holes. And he said, you know what, Keith, you ought to get into speech and debate. And he said, I'd make my library available to you. He said, you should get into Lincoln-Douglas debate, and there's a lot of stuff that you'd talk about that maybe my staff could help you with. Well, he did take me under his wing, and I did get involved. And as a result of that, I ended up winning the National Speech and Debate Tournament in the United States in debate. And, and by the way, I decided not to get in politics. Congressman Murtha was indicted, <laughs> actually, but anyway. Um, <laughs> lovely man, though. Um, and 
throughout all of that, I had to ask myself a question. Why did he do that? Yeah, he, he, they saw something in me. I was a charismatic kid, blah, blah, blah. Lots of the kids were. I'm going to say something that might be a little bit off in your mind. <clears throat> but they took care of me in that way, particularly Mrs. Poland, because I took two strokes off of her golf score. <laughs> There's a lot of people in this world. If you want to enlist a movement of individuals, you better show up at the golf course a half of an hour early for every one of them. Your capacity to lead with generosity, to lead with service, to lead not with hierarchy, control, or the assumption that you deserve to lead, but to lead with the ability to enlist people because they know that by affiliating with you, they will go higher. Is that, an, is that clear to you? Now, there are other elements to leadership that we often forget. It's not just, and I spoke a lot about this in Never Eat Alone, about the focus on generosity and authenticity. But there are a couple of other elements that are so important. We've got to start enacting strongly in our lives. At, at the halfway house, Mrs. Poling used to always send me over to get her to pretty much the same lunch. A couple of, uh, it was a hamburger, a hot dog, a Coca-Cola, and a... Um, uh, a chocolate milk. Mrs. Poland was obese, and she smoked cigarettes. She always, ha always had me get her a pack of cigarettes because she would have smoked the first pack the first nine holes. She's still alive. <laughs> Lovely woman, actually. Um, and what's really interesting about that is one day, because I'd gotten to know her very well, her son had become one of my best friends. They took me on vacations. They helped my parents get jobs. It was a really beautiful friendship. I called her mom. One day I came back, not with our normal lunch, but I came back with a salad and a tab. And no cig Remember Diet Coke for old people? Right? Drink this, get cancer. Anyway. Um, and, and no cigarettes. And she was so pissed for about... A second and then a tear came to her eye literally and she hugged me what did she realize in that short period of time you cared. I cared. I cared my care gave me permission to hold her accountable my care gives you permission to be candid conflict avoidance is one of the greatest eroders of shareholder value Conflict avoidance and a lack of butt-kicking accountability will hold your movement back. You have no right, you have no right to sequester your truth if you care about the mission. <clears throat> and if you're a leader and there's conflict avoidance on your team, shame on us. We've got to open up the power and the importance to recognize that truth-telling and accountability are critical. For the remainder of our 25 minutes, what I want to try to do is give you a bit of a formula to start your movement. And your movement starts with a mission. Your movement starts with whatever what you're trying to achieve. A changed societal problem, a process improvement in your workplace, a transformation of product, right, a difference in your family, whatever your mission is, the first question you need to ask yourself, and this is, it's interesting, we always have objectives and we have plans and we have strategies and we have initiatives, right? Where's your people plan? I call it a relationship action plan, a wrap. Everything you're trying to achieve needs a wrap. It needs a relationship action plan. Who are the most critical individuals that need to move your movement? inside of your company, outside of your company, who are those critical individuals? And they have nothing to do with hierarchy. They have nothing to do with whether you pay them. These are individuals critical to achievement of your movement. You get it? So with that in mind, and recognizing that you need to enlist those individuals, the next point is that it's all on you. I don't care if they're assholes. 
I don't care if they've never wanted to work with you in the past. I don't care if they're difficult. I don't care if they're unapproachable. If you're an individual who has a mission, then it's all on you. The movement of my boy Daniel from that picture on the left to the picture on the right, do you think I ever had the honor or the right to say, when you start being my son, I will be your father? No, I had to work 99.9% .9 of the way forever because my mission was clear. When I brought that foster child into our home, my commitment was that I will be his father, whether he acknowledges it or not. Do you recognize that your job as a leader has nothing to do whether someone's going to accept that or not? You have to work hard to build the relationships for as long as you need to build the relationships to achieve the mission at hand and to serve those individuals as difficult as that might be. Because if you're a leader, leadership is difficult. Now, the second thing you have to recognize is that your team, as you recruit them, the first person that you invite into your team, you are actually inviting them into their team. Leadership in this day and age is not yours. It's theirs. You're just a humble servant and a host of a movement yet to be created with members yet to be identified and yet to recognize. You're holding space for the movement. Now your job is to invite people into their movement. It's a co-creation. I recommend to leaders who have a vision, who have a powerful vision. In the past, they would say, follow my vision. And I say, no, walk out humbly and suggest that maybe you have a vision which is 30% baked. Please join me and take the 60% together. And then over time, we'll, we'll, we'll recruit the kind of people that will take it to 70%. And we'll never get to 100% because our mission is going to grow and thrive and be so powerful that we'll keep enlisting individuals to co-create and change that movement with us. It's not your movement. It's theirs. You're holding space. I mentioned before, and it's so important, you've got to open yourselves to candor. You've got to open yourselves to criticism. You've got to open yourselves to challenge. You've got to, I mean, the best leaders on a periodic basis would walk into their team and their movement and they would say to those individuals, please write down on a piece of paper what I need to do to go higher in service of you. And then read those out loud to the people sitting there and say back to them, thank you so much. Even though in the back of your head you're saying, this is crazy, they're so full of shit. They don't understand. But you're going to say thank you so that you keep the faucet turned on. As soon as you turn off that faucet of candor and transparency and fluid thinking, you have capped your capacity for transformation. Then when you hear it, here's the thing about feedback in my new model. In the new model of a team, you don't have to accept the feedback. You just have to be grateful for it. And you can say that to them, which also gives them the, the capacity to do it to each other. I want you to facilitate open dialogue as a gift, a gift that they can ignore or re-gift or put in a drawer, that's fine. But people, if they hear it fluidly enough, they'll understand it and it'll absorb. And if they don't, you don't want them on your team anymore, that's possible too. But in the meantime, open up the flow of the candor so that people can download that and then you say to your team, of all the stuff that I got, thank you, I'm going to do these two things differently for the next quarter. Watch me. And when you see me violating it, tell me. And then invite them to do the same. It's so important, though, remember that you've built a foundation of relationship through, through generosity and intimacy so that they know that that candor is coming from a commitment to the mission and each other. I've created a new word for this type of collaboration. It's not just collaboration. I feel, and I call it co-elevation. 
Two years ago, I created the word because I felt that we didn't have a word for what I was talking about. I want to go higher together. I want people committed to a mission and each other. I want people so committed they won't let each other fail. They will co-elevate in your movement. Not just to achieve, but to grow. And I know how powerful growth is to everybody here. And what, that to me is part of the generosity you're offering. You're offering the generosity of saying, come and be with us and grow and thrive and aspire. And we will always be better. Go to the 30%, 60%. I'm, and I know this to be true. I am barely 30% of the leader that I need to be. Truly, believe me, talk to my people. But if I know that and I say it with humility and honesty, then I'm inviting constant, constant iteration and growth. And so will my movement, my correction, so will our movement. Coaching is different than teaching. If you've heard of 70-20-10, it's a construct in the corporate world that we've researched, and it shows that only 10% of the way we truly change our behavior is through knowledge. How many of you know what you have to change and you still do it? Raise your hands. Yeah, right? You know, if, I, if knowledge was enough to change human behavior, I wouldn't have drank so much last night. <laughs> <laughs> or stayed up so late. It's just not. What, what does change behavior is action, practices. You listening to this is corporate entertainment, right? What I need you to do is make commitments. And if I had my druthers, I would be there with you, understanding those commitments, giving you a one-month assignment as Quest does in Mind Valley, and a series of those one-month assignments acts as virtual coaching. But coaching is about putting things to action and coming back and processing what worked and what didn't work. And that's what we all have to go through. And we have to open up coaching in our teams. Coaching can't come from hierarchy. I just wrote a piece recently for the Wall Street Journal. Managers don't have time to coach anymore. And that's okay. As a result, managers need to begin to disperse the coaching as good managers into the team. The model of coaching peer-to-peer -peer is the model that most organizations ignore because there is an abundance of facilitated, capable advice and coaching all around us every day. We actually, with the people who see us doing the work, more than our managers do. Our ability to open up our movements to be coaches of each other, though requires the foundational psychological safety born from a relationship in humility and vulnerability and generosity. But on that foundation of relationship, you can have candor and accountability and coaching and growth. And that's the formula. Intimacy and generosity breeds candor and accountability. And in a world of co-creation, in a world of co-development, that's the co-elevation formula. As a leader, we've got to be humble and we've got to open ourselves up for being nothing more than many of you, I meant, I've met you, you're 60 to 70% of the leaders you need to be. But at least let your folks know that and invite them to help you because you need the permission for them to invite each other. One of the things that happens a lot in our lives and in organizations, I see it all the time, is the victim mindset. And it's obviously one of the antithesis of the abundance mindset. But the victim mindset is when somebody else is responsible for your state. And I don't know, I just don't buy that. You know, I never have. I wouldn't be where I am today if at any point somebody else or my financial insecurity or my financial disadvantage as a child or any of the things that I've bumped up against, people that have frustrated me. It's so interesting. I, I've had leaders in my business at Ferrazzi Greenlight that frustrated the hell out of me. And, and my whole energy aimed at them was, well, they may be making money for me, they may be good with clients, 
but I have such a difficulty with them as individuals. Right? And I blame them for our relationship. I've had partners and spouses in my life, business partners and people in my life in intimate ways where it was their fault. And it wasn't until I realized and begun to open up to the realization that nothing is anyone else's fault. If I have a mission, then as I said before, it's all on me. And blaming another individual, an ounce of energy blaming another individual is an ounce of energy that is stolen from the ideation of possibility and transformation where we could be co-creating with other individuals to get to the place we're trying to go. And that needs to be, that's one of the things you need to coach into your team. When you hear the victim mindset, when you hear anybody in your team blaming anybody for anything, the question is, great, that's a market force, so be it. And a market force could be an asshole in the company. The market force could be a different, difficult client. The market force could be competition. It could be a shift in the market. It could be anything. That's a market force. So what are we going to do about it? We got to make that a rule. We got to make that a rule. Now, I don't know about anybody else, but having been brought up as a poor kid, uh, and I've always put a lot of pressure on myself. And that pressure on myself, I used to say as a young leader, I'm not treating anybody else around me any different than I'm treating myself. Well, that doesn't quite work. <laughs> and in fact, one of the things that I loved Adam's poem of love yourself like somebody you're in love with. Right? We've got to celebrate other people magnificently. Now, I also think we have to celebrate ourselves magnificently. But, but I have to say that that Pavlovian response to something positive, whether it's food or a high five, is really the motivation and the fuel for people to take the hills together. We've got to celebrate. This is a community that knows how to celebrate. Let's take that back into our movements. Let's make the invitation into our movements an invitation into joy, an invitation into love, an invitation into hugs. I know a lot of the stuff we're working on is heavy stuff. And I know a lot of the times we're in are difficult times. But as a leader, we need to keep our energy and our engagement of our people positive and high the entire time. The ultimate mark of a great leader is when you can step back and not be the hub and spoke to a group of individuals, but when you watch all of the leaders in your movement co-elevate with each other, where the contract changes from hierarchy to co-elevation. You know, I've been working with 60 of the largest organizational heads of HR in the world. And I have a community of these individuals who meet for dinner parties and meet for seminars that I host and facilitate in New York, Los Angeles, San Francisco, and Chicago. And we're trying to figure out how does this new model of co-elevation fit to traditional org design that has been created over years and years of tradition and ritual in organizations. And it saddens me when I see some of the fastest growing companies in the world adopting these old models from the HR leaders who have gone to work for these unicorn companies, and in fact, adopting the same models of the companies they have just been working to disenfranchise. <laughs> there will be an adoption of an entirely different way of organization design, but in the meantime, I don't give a damn about your org design. You can have all the silos, hierarchies, and functional org designs and pendulum swings of reorg every moment or other moment. It doesn't matter to me. But if you 
as an individual, think in the way of co-elevation, if you think in the way of interdependency, if you just ask yourself, what is my goal, who is my team, and how am I going to en en enlist that team, and how are we going to lead that movement, then you can have any damn org design you want. Right? Your ability to change the world is your ability to live in this co-elevation. Now, I do want commitments to be made today. And I would ask you just to take a moment right now and reflect. What one person, what one person will you invite when you leave here to your movement? I mean, I would love to be one of them in the, any ways that I can. I try to put as much of this stuff out on, deeper stuff on LinkedIn. I write for Harvard Business Review. Um, I, my fun stuff and my quippy stuff goes out on Instagram. But for any of you leading a powerful movement, I'm here, by the way, because I believe in the Mind Valley movement. I really do. It's not for what they pay. <laughs> I believe in the Mind Valley movement. And the Mind Valley movement is one I want to serve, truly and deeply. It's making a difference in the world. For anybody else, leading a movement, I want to serve you. And whether it's just through the, the, the stuff that we're producing or when we get our, our camp at Topanga Canyon put together, you know, we'll be able to lead retreats there for you, etc. But I want to serve your movement and I want to co-create. I invite any of you who wants to crack the code of how to accelerate community and what that looks like to come and talk to me, whether it's virtually or physically. Because one of the things I want to do in the next few months is I want to host at my facility in Topanga, I want to host a 50-person communal of people who are practitioners like Vision or researchers like Brene Brown or individuals out there who I don't even know who want to figure out how to accelerate the creation of activated movements and communities. And I want to publish that material for the world so that you can lead your movement better. It's a big journey. It's a big journey. Um, and I've been studying it for 15 years, but I'm just scratching the surface. We are just scratching the surface. Some of you heard about my mom. Um, by the way, for a long time, I used to talk about my dad. There's a great story about my dad and how he, um, one Christmas, went shopping for me in uh, somebody's trash along the side of the road and brought home this big wheel and how that was so embarrassing to me, because I was in the car and I was afraid my snooty friends from school would see. Um, and what it really taught me, though, was the power of reaching out and the power of audacity, but it also taught me to reflect upon how the woman who gave us that big wheel must have felt Christmas Eve um, and how important it is to recognize that asking for something is really a gift to somebody who's able to give you and feel the act of giving. I told that story all the time. And my mom said to me one time, she goes, why don't you ever tell a story about me? <laughs> I meditated on it just for a moment and I realized there was a wonderful story I could tell about mom. Um, when I was writing my last book, Who's Got Your Back, which I love, that book is probably, <clears throat> Never Eat Alone is like eating popcorn. So consumable and fun, and everyone's like, oh, you know, that book changed my life, and I'm really, I'm so blessed. I go all over the world, and it's such a blessing to have touched people through a piece that I stumbled into a number of years ago. But Who's Got Your Back is a book that is deeply meaningful to me because it teaches the practice of creating a small group of individuals around you that won't let you fail. And when I was writing that book, I thought about my mother, and I realized today as I'm writing my new book, Leading Without Authority, and the subject of co-elevation, um, which is long overdue and hopefully 
the end of this year. Um, I thought about my mother who had a group like that. It wasn't a movement, but it was the beginning of what could have been one if she wanted to activate it. She had a group of ladies that would always meet once a month, and they met literally once a month for 45 years. And she called them the card club girls. The card club girls. I said, Mom, tell me a little bit about the card club girls. She said, oh, well, when your dad was unemployed for six months, those group of ladies used to cook extra and swing back around the house when your dad wasn't around, and we were able to put food on the table without having to go to welfare cheese, which is what was given to us when unemployment ran out by the government. We never had to have welfare cheese because those groups of ladies cooked extra food for us, and your dad never knew. He always thought, I stretched the dollar. And when your aunt died, those group of ladies and I sat on her deathbed two days before, and we didn't cancel card club because she didn't want to. We played cards with her for the last time and said goodbye. That was them at my last book tour. And unfortunately, there's only three of them left. My mom says there's one of these days there's going to be one of them sitting there playing cards, thinking about the others. And then she talked about how that group of ladies made sure that when my dad died, that she got out of the house every single day for months until she was ready to get out by herself. When I heard that story, first of all, I was so blessed that my mother has that, right? Even to this day. And yet, I looked inside of myself and I said, Keith, you don't. And I started what I called a lifeline group that met at my home with two couples, three couples, including myself at the time. And we would have a, and I talk about this in Who's Got Your Back, we would have a commitment for who we wanted to be in the next month. And we'd talk about who we were in the last month. And we'd keep track and hold each other accountable. We called them lifeline groups. It was very powerful. This was a number of years ago. And I recognized how powerful and important that was in my life. And then as I started researching this work around co-levation, what I really realized was I was not that leader. I wasn't creating that inside of my company. Today I can say that I am more joyful than any part of my, any time in my life. I am more happy and joyful than I am today. And I do have a team that won't let each other fail. And we will invite people into our movement. But it's not my decision anymore. It's our decision. That's been so different as a leader than when I was clinging and clutching to the success of my business, to when I let go of that and I said, it's our collective opportunity to lead the movement that we're trying to leave in the world. It's like night and day. So, so that's, that's, my, that's my invitation to you. This idea of leading without authority isn't just for the current leader, and it's not just for the individual. Look, frankly, when I was a little kid at Deloitte, I was chief marketing officer at Deloitte, chief marketing officer at Starwood, I led without authority. I grew up through Deloitte and became the youngest chief marketing officer in the Fortune 500 because I didn't wait for the authority to become the chief marketing officer. I started serving the organization as the chief marketing officer and became recognized for the work that I was doing. Right? And then what I needed to learn and what I'm learning now as a leader with some authority is that my authority, if I rely on it, is only going to hold back the opportunity of transformation. I know what I'm trying to do is important to the world right now. And I, I know I need you 
and I'm not quite sure yet how to make it happen. That's why I'm here. And uh, thank you.